Up until today, our impressions of the digital world has been always through a screen, always confined by a frame. We're now taking that frame and stepping inside of it and starting to interact directly with the data. And I'm happy to be here today to talk about how virtual and augmented realities will be integrated in our daily lives in the same way as the internet and the mobile phones has been throughout the years, and how it's going to change the way that we interact with computers and how it might actually redefine what we think reality is. But first of all, I want to start by sharing a story. Uh, three years ago, I was invited to DPRK, also known as North Korea. Um, I was there to speak about startup mindset. It's a long story, but uh, since I'm running a VR company called Scene There, I thought I'd bring along my VR camera. And uh, I was able to capture a lot of material and built uh, the world's first virtual tour of Pyongyang. It's probably the only way that you freely can walk around in Pyongyang. And uh, uh, even though I think it's amazing to have people beamed into this most isolated country in the world and see how it, life is there, the opposite is even more interesting. Uh, one of the nights we had a chance to sit down with one of our guides and drink a few beers, and I was able to show him what virtual reality looks like. I took him to Helsinki, and uh, while this guide was wearing the VR headsets and walking around outside Lolo, the sauna here, and looking for hot girls, <laughs> uh, I thought to myself, He's not here anymore. We beamed him to Finland. So that's when I understood the power of this technology to bridge a geography and start uh, connecting people in a whole new ways. I like to think of virtual reality as the ultimate illusion. In essence, it's two screens in the front of your head. And when you move your head, the virtual reality stays put where it is, just your, like your real world does. And, and um, <clears throat> it makes it possible for us to have a first-person experience and get a, a direct experience of these digital worlds that we haven't had before. You are not only longer an observer of someone else's story, you're in the story and participating in it. But virtual reality is so much more than games and entertainment, and that's what I want to talk about now. Uh, Chris Milk, famous VR pioneer and director, uh, talk about how VR can be used as the ultimate empathy machine. Uh, him and, and Gabor Arora created a film called Klaus of a Seed Ride. It was shot with 360 cameras and shows the inside of a refugee camp in uh, Syria, uh, a Syrian refugee camp in Jordania. And uh, what struck me when I saw it for the first time was that someone, uh, a little boy in the refugee camp, was looking into the camera. And when he looked in the camera, it felt like our eyes were meeting. And I was, got a wave of empathy for this person. And that's unique. It's the first time we can do this. And it was showed on a high-level donation gala for, uh, for humanitarian aid, for raising funding. They were expecting to get $2.2 billion in funding, but they got $3.8 billion. So, and UNICEF has showed that people are twice as likely to donate for a cause if they've been exposed to a VR experience. So VR can actually really create empathy. And VR is... VR is really nothing new. It's been around since 1960s in the labs, and I'm really happy that we made some progress with the form factor since then. <laughs> but it was not until 2012 when we saw the first consumer-grade qualities when Oculus kickstarted the uh, Oculus headset on, on Kickstarter. It was priced $700 and, uh, or euro, and you needed a PC to run it for 2,000 euro. Three years later, you got the same experience in a mobile phone fart and form factor, 100 euro plus 700 for the mobile phone. Now in 2019, Oculus is launching Oculus uh, Quest, which gives you the same experience as what you saw in the void for 400 euros. So price is coming down and the experience gets better. And I would say that the form factor is also becoming smaller. Very soon, I think we will see something uh, more like sunglasses. And um, look at the resolution. In 2013, our screens were 1K. Then, three years later, 2K. Three years later, 4K. This is exponential, but we're going beyond that. With Vario's new headset, VR1, that we're actually showing here on the summit, we're going beyond that. 20K is the equivalent of what our eyes can see. It's the world's first human eye resolution uh, VR headset. This picture is from a normal headset on the market. 
uh, you can see that there are some pixels in it. It's a very zoomed in picture that you're experiencing in VR. This picture is from the Vario headset. And this screen doesn't really do it justice. You have to try it out for yourself. It's mind blowing. Everything looks super sharp. And it's really, truly redefining virtual reality. And when you think about the form factor minimizing and uh, the screens are getting better and better and the price are coming down, more and more people will get access to this technology. In fact, Mark Zuckerberg predicted that he would get one billion people into virtual reality. And it makes sense when you think of it as the next level computing platform, because it is essentially a social space. We are seeing the birth of that already with Facebook spaces where you can interact with people, you can play games and share content with each other. And Yes, we do look like avatars, but it's changing very fastly. If you look at this, we're able now to capture volumetric rendering, so 3D videos that you can actually walk around with, which really captures the human feel of this. And this picture, this video shows the um, Facebook's latest announcement of how you can, with a 2D image of your face, represent it in 3D and have real eye contact with the person's avatar, even though you're wearing the VR headsets. So it's not very far-fetched to think that in a close future, we will be able to have a holographic representation of ourselves. I would be able to do this presentation virtually. I'd be having my own body language. You can see my eyes. And maybe next time you're having a, pre uh, a meeting on the other side of the planet, you'll think twice about that flight and take that meeting in VR. And also, beyond eyes and ears, we're getting sensation. So this is a haptic glove and a haptic suit that gives you tactile feedback. So we're able to feel virtual objects. And in fact, telepresence is coming as well. There is an uh, XPRIZE announced today called the Avatar XPRIZE, which aims to, in five to 10 years, announce the general purpose avatar that can be remotely controlled with VR so that you can do remote maintenance uh, or uh, go into dangerous places with this. OK, that's pretty far-fetched. So robots in VR, let's bring it back to reality. In fact, let's talk about augmented reality. So augmented reality shares some similarities with VR in that it's visualizing virtual objects. And um, you can take out your phone, for example, and, uh, or a tablet, and see virtual objects positioned in the real world. And if you upload these objects uh, into something called the AR cloud, you can have persistence of these objects. So multiple users, independently of devices, can see these objects in, uh, in the real world. But augmented reality goes beyond the phone. It's actually moving into the glasses. And judging by the number of uh, acquisitions that Apple has done in this area, it's likely that they will announce some new glasses within the next two years. And <clears throat> there are already some glasses out there. These are mixed reality glasses. They are aware of the surroundings. These are called Magic Leap. They're priced to $2,000, so they're for professionals. But they give a glimpse on what we're going to see in the future, also for the consumer market, in a few years. This is how an experience in a mixed reality headset looks like. So you would have virtual objects interacting with the real world, positioned, absolutely positioned in the real world. So you can walk around, you can position, and you can draw and place objects there. And these glasses gives your whole field of vision into a big screen. So next time you're traveling, maybe you don't actually need to lug your laptop around. So let's recap a little bit on the uh, terminology. On the left-hand side here, we have the real reality, which consists of the real world, and virtual reality consisting of a computer-generated world. Somewhere in between, you have augmented and mixed reality, which takes from both worlds. And the overall umbrella term is called extended reality, or XR. And in fact, these things are now merging more and more. Very soon, we will see uh, a new product which has a VR headset with cameras through it. This is a mixed reality headset done with a VR headset. And this is our, from various vision, from how photorealistic mixed reality will be done through a VR headset. So I think my favorite futurist, Kevin Kelly, put it very well when he said that the word real is going to be one of the most relative words we have. Because you might all sit here and share the real world, but you might have AR glasses on you and see completely different things depending on which virtual worlds you're plugged into. So the, uh, the reality is being redefined. What about the implications of this? What are the oppor opportunities in this space? Well, first of all, 
uh, 3D tools from gaming is gaining traction inside enterprise and traditional industries. So if you really want to get started with VR and AR, hire a game developer. Secondly, AR cloud and VR headsets will push the need for 5G networks because we're going to need more cloud computing and cloud rendering closer to the base stations. And that will be one of the driving uh, uh, needs for these kind of 5G networks. What about the ethics? Every new technology comes with a, so a set of ethical questions, and so do VR as well. Who controls these, what's allowed in this VR world? They're completely digital. Who enforces this? Well, we talked about how VR can create empathy. Let's think about the opposite. What if VR can decrease empathy? Like in the TV series Westworld, where you can create a simulation where you can learn to rape or shoot people. Should this be allowed? And what do we do with all this information overload? And what about the screen addiction if your screens are glued to your face? Well, I don't know all these questions, but it's for sure something that we need to have a discussion on with uh, all the parts that develops this technology, because right now we can actually influence it. Training and education is one of the best opportunities in this space. It's been used for a long time because VR is really, uh, learning is really about immersion. So pilots have been training in simulators for a long time, but they've been dome projections. Now all of a sudden, VR headset becomes high, good enough and high enough resolution so you can actually replace these dome projections with something much cheaper, the VR headsets. Same goes with firefighters and doctors. You can train and avoid uh, fatal mistakes. And in the industry, you can use AR headsets to train your workflows and also combine with remote helpers uh, tuning into maintenance and, and uh, manufacturing lines, already saving a lot of uh, times. And also in traditional education, I believe we could see geography lectures done in Google Earths for VR, or why not learning a language completely immersed in that surroundings? And the human's imagination is really limited about our experiences. And this is where VR really can help, delivering an experience in order for us to think further and make the right decisions. The car industry is already pioneering this when they're doing design reviews, but beyond that, also to align different departments into the same common vision about the future. This can also be used for democratizing uh, urban planning, for example. This, uh, many, uh, many uh, people in the city can now, from their own point of view, see what a new building project will look like. And in construction, people are using AR glasses for visualizing the future of the, the wires and the rebarring, uh, and so to avoid costly mistakes when the building is being built. And for a customer, this could also look like this. This is Amazon's AR view, which can visualize any product in 3D and how it fits into your home. And beyond visualization, we can also use these tools for creating things. Uh, Google's Tilt Brush is a, a splendid example on how someone without any experience from 3D tools can go into virtual reality and paint in midair. And so far, this is a single user experience. But imagine if you have an office here in the Nordic with three people collaborating on the same design, and three people in China also get collaborating on the same design. This will be completely new ways of collaboration. And beyond design, we can also use this for acting, actually. Motion capture has been quite expensive, only used by, by Hollywood. But anyone with a VR headset today can actually do create an animated story with these tools. So we talked about how VR can help create empathy for a cause. We talked about how it can cut emissions in travel, how it can uh, also scale education. And this last example is about medicine. Brazilian doctors in a project called Walk Again was able to use virtual reality glasses together with EEG to treat patients suffering from uh, um, um, they're paralyzed from the waist down, so they can't move their legs. By reading the signals from the EEG and visualizing the movement of the leg, they were able to fool the brain to grow new nerve endings so that the person, a patient, was able to move his real legs again. So VR is the ultimate illusion, but it can have real effects in the real life. 
And that's what I'm mostly excited about. Come and check out the test in the Vario, Vario headsets, and keep your eyes open for the news this week. We are launching something really exciting. Thank you.